Hello, listeners, and welcome to another Russo Magic branded episode here with your boy Rocky T, the Gardner Mark Gross, and friend of the show, Just Incredible. Mr. Gardner, how are you going? How's the weather and what's growing? Uh, well, I've got hot peppers. I've got sweet peppers. I have lettuce. I have radishes, which are actually looking really decent. Um, not as good as my girlfriend's radishes, but that's not actually a code word. She actually grows radishes, guys. Um, I've got tomatoes. I've got cherry tomatoes. I have all kinds of things. I've got both – excuse me. I have both a community garden and I have uh, buckets out back of my place. So I'm doing all kinds of gardening, and I'm loving it, and I'm really enjoying it. I have a giant serrano that I'm about to cut down and dice up and put in some salsa. But uh, you know, most most salsa is made by the best Latinos, and I think that we know a Latino that's on the show today, mm. and that would be Mr. P. J. Palaco. What's going on, fellas? How is everybody? Trying to Good. stay dry in Houston, man. We've been having some bipolar weather. It's just raining for 20 minutes, and then sunshine, and then more rain, and thunderstorms for literally the last two weeks. I've gone to the car wash three times, and it literally <laughs> rained on me that same afternoon every time. <laughs> It's okay. been it, it's been actually similar uh, in the East Coast. Um, yeah. Very yeah, it's all over the place, you know. So uh, yeah, I feel you on that one, man. But yeah, uh, well, happy to be back here on the show, guys. So it's good to hear from you. Good to hear your voices. Well, absolutely, bro. Um, so like you know, it's been schizo- schizophrenic weather down here. Uh, today everything was coated in pollen. We should be past pollen. Mm. Like my 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 yeah. my little silver car, Bob the Bullet. I named it after. Bullet Bob Armstrong. Of course. Coated in yellow pollen. Oh, no. I mean, just, just, it was crazy. But anyway, so PJ, you want to lead us off and talk about some stuff, and I think there's something you need to get off your chest. Yeah, um, you know, just really quick, uh, I just wanted, you know, this, the, Mav uh, is a good friend of, of the shows and a friend of, our, of ours, a friend of mine. Um, I was supposed to get some stuff out to him, which I did not, so I just wanted to let him know personally on air that uh, i'd not forgotten uh it was my fault i uh completely botched the deal uh which basically means i completely forgot about it so i apologize and i will make good on it so mav there you go i'm sorry about that we'll make good all right so today's topic is going to be lost storylines or storylines that went nowhere and everybody just kind of scratched their head and said what so i know you were part of one so pj why don't you lead us off buddy well, I mean, there's so many great ones. Um, I mean, you know, you, you always in wrestling, when you when you start something, you always think like, wow, this is going to be, you know, it has the opportunity to be something really great. And um, but one I have and not a lot of people know this, uh, this just it kind of happened, um, you know, because of the nature of the business at the time and what was going on in the wrestling world. And this is about mid 2000s. Um, I brought in. Well, you I was kind of a single handed effort to bring Scott Hall to wrestle in ECW. Um, It was kind of like, uh, you know, Scott had just kind of been let go from WCW or his, you know, contract was up, whatever. Uh, I know he'd he'd been going through some personal stuff, but, you know, it was just a great time to say, hey, you know, let's 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 get you in here. ECW was still even in 2000, even though we were going through financial difficulties. Um, it was still a hot place. Like as, as far as the business went, like, you know, the, the actual storylines and attendance and stuff that was doing well, uh, fan, fan base was, was hot. So Scott came in and, uh, he worked with me. We had a one singles match in Poughkeepsie, New York, um, which has huge significance because that's, uh, the place where Vince McMahon, um, you know, used to tape Monday night raw. You know, yes. and even Vince, even Vince Senior used to tape WWE superstars in Poughkeepsie in that building. That was the building where him and One Two Three Kid, where uh, famously I think Kid missed a dive and he almost killed himself, knocked himself out. Um, that was that <laughs> building. You know, uh, there's just it just anyways. They, it was a, to me it was like just kind of like a bucket list thing, and um, and Paulie loved it. Um, Scott loved it. I don't think he understood what ECW was at the time. And the whole thing was to get him back to do a, an entire program with him and myself. Uh, basically, you know, like I was the bastard son of the click um, that I was never really, you know, mentioned or appreciated. And that was kind of going to be the deal um, because re- realistically, I was more of Scott Scott's friend than anybody else's really, you know. But um, 
but anyways, it was just, I, I thought, and Paul thought, it was a great opportunity to kind of just further that along, especially with Scott having such great, you know, at that time, you know, the NWO, even though it was a couple of years removed, was still one of the hottest things in the business, you know, so he still had all that, uh, all that stuff, you know, to, to bring to the table. So, uh, you know, I just wish we would have got a chance to do it, but unfortunately a couple of months later, um, ECW was no longer. So even if everything would have aligned, I don't think, um, we, you know, time-wise, we could have pulled it off the way uh, the business went. Well, my question for you at that time is, um, because Paul was in bed with Vince, so to speak, um, do you think that they would have brought anybody from WWE down to work with you to further the storyline if ECW stayed in contact and stayed financially stable? See, I, I I don't even know, man. I I, I don't think I, I I know for a fact that Vince only knew ECW as far as namesake. I, I I know for a fact he did not understand the product. I don't think he ever really watched the product. I could guarantee you he didn't. Um, it was just more of he knew ECW was a thing, and he you know he he basically got a very rudimentary education on ECW, probably a briefing prior to a meeting or something like that. You know, this is what ECW is, pal, kind of a thing. Um, but it never really got off the ground floor with with Vince, uh, as far as what it could be, as far as a an intellectual property, as far as you know what I mean. It was yeah. it was always Paul Heyman's vision. And, uh, and I think Paul made, they kind of did that for a reason to kind of like, you know, he'll always have a, a, a spot in the game, so to speak, if uh, he holds that card close to the vest. Well, I, I think that was that was a brilliant move. But um, I, I, so I'm going to bring up something that I thought was like really, really funny. And it was one of the worst storylines of all time. And it, it had a finish, but it shouldn't have had a finish. It should have just gone away. And that was <laughs> Mark Henry. And May Young and the birth of the hand. Yes. Now that this is you, were you even in WWE at that point, or you? I was not. I was not. Okay. I, saw, I saw that from a distance. Yes. See, the thing is, it was a garbage storyline, and of course, you couldn't go anywhere with it. And nobody could believe that a woman that old is going to be impregnated. I don't care if he's sexual chocolate or not. You're not going to be impregnated. Okay, your body at some point shuts down you go through menopause we all know the rules okay but the fact that they didn't wait another month or two when raw was going to be a day before or a day after april fool's day to reveal it uh. it makes no sense that they just didn't have the vision to say okay well we can we can unveil it at this point and say it's a joke they botched right. it. yeah instead they botched it so that's that's one of my because that there was no point to that whole storyline. It was it was a punishment for Mark Henry for some reason, and there's about six or seven people I would never punish: Mark Henry, Kane, Undertaker, Paul White. That's about it. Like there's a lot of people who will squash you like a bug, and you know all the stories that that Undertaker talks about, like. Mark Henry picking up the tour bus overseas and moving it on his back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. why would you punish that guy? I get the fact that he didn't go over the way they wanted him to, but they gave him a really bad skill set. They gave him a, a punch, slap, body kick, body slam. Like that's that's why he didn't get over. That's why he never, you know, became what he was until the Hall of Pain. And still, it was. I don't want to say too little, too late, because I do have a lot of respect for Mark Henry, and I think that he is somewhat of a locker leader. And a locker room leader, I should say. And I think that he has a lot to give back to the business. And I really feel that, like, he was just not approached in the right way. But that whole thing with the hand, that was just the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's close to Katie Vick, but it's not yeah. quite Katie Ooh, Vick. Can't talk yeah. about that. Rock, why don't you take one? Well, I'm going to go I'm going to pivot a, a little way to a storyline, not necessarily one that – we didn't have it finished to because, you know, creative or somebody walked out or injury. But this one was actually due to a death tragedy struck. And that was a storyline from 1997. This was a storyline between Brian Pillman and Goldust. The storyline took place in 1997 and was one of the more controversial and dramatic angles of that era. 
the feud added a personal twist involving Terry Reynolds, who was the real life and on screen valet of Goldust. The storyline kicked off with Brian Pillman making lewd comments and advances towards Marlena. Pillman claimed he'd had past relationships with her, and that's what started and added the uh, personal uh, animosity to the feud. They had a stipulation match at SummerSlam 97. Um, They had a couple matches, but then before they could actually get the payoff to the storyline, tragedy struck and and we we, we lost Pillman. Um, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was when Pillman showed up on WWE TV because I didn't learn until years later that he was, you know, going in between uh, companies, showing up on ECW TV and WCW, and that's a big deal. So for me, growing up and then learning about it later on, I realized how how much we really lost out on that talent. And for both of these guys, that could have been a very good payoff. So were either one of, uh, you weren't there either yet in '97, uh, PJ? Were you? No, I was not. I was early, not. but you, but you still knew the guys. So did you have anything to to add to that? Um, I had actually only met Brian uh, in passing. I didn't know him oh, really? at all. I was I was okay. a huge fan. I was a huge fan. I don't know huge. why I assume all wrestlers know all wrestlers. I just yeah <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I unfortunately I was, but I'll tell you one thing. It's funny you say that. Um, he was one of the reasons I loved the business, and he was like one of my favorites as a mark when I was a mark in high school. You know, like Brian Pillman when he first came into WCW in like eighty nine ninety. 91, like, that's when I graduated high school, right before I went to wrestling camp. So I was a huge uh, Brian Pillman fan. So, yeah, I only, you know, I admired him so much. I wish I would have got to know him, you know. So let me ask you something, PJ. Do you think that Just Incredible versus the Loose Cannon, Brian Pillman, you'd have to be, you'd have to be the heel? Oh, you'd yeah. Sell out the ECW. Do you think you could sell out bigger than ECW Arena? Oh, of course. Jeez. I mean, we were, I mean, you know, it, again, it all depends. I mean, it's all happenstance, but I, I remember it's like anything else when it, the business is hot and it is hot right now. Um, even though you could argue with AEW's numbers, uh, at the, at the gate, it's, it's very bad. But, yes. um, I mean, I, I, I just can, I, all I could say is when we were doing it, um, as ECW, we were, we were selling 3000 tickets, Per event. I mean, and I'm not talking, mean, I know that doesn't, that you can't compare to a WWE or a WCW at the time, but we were also running considerably smaller venues. You yes. know what I mean? We weren't running 20,000 seat venues. We were literally running gymnasiums, which we probably got for five or $600 on rental and selling, you know, 3,000 tickets and stuffing fans in, and which also made it look great on television. You know what I mean? So I think that was the kind of the charm of, of the whole thing. It made it feel underground. It felt real. And um, and there was there was really something to that because um, it, it's easy to go to a house show for WWE or a TV taping for WWE. But ECW, it was like it was something else to it, you know, because it was almost like um, you're going to a product. You know, it's like almost like you're a- as a fan, you're asked to do something. You need to, you you're asked to kind of participate and partake in the madness. Um, and that's what kind of made ECW so cool. So it kind of all goes hand in hand, you know? No, I get it. I just, just kind of curious because I, I believe that the two of you could have definitely sold something. Oh, we out could have sold I, some tickets, man. Oh my God. That would have been a dream. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think for sure, but I mean, that's, but that's it. What I was trying to get at is in uh, 2001, right before we closed up, no, I'm, I'm, I, I'll, I'll go back June of 2000. We did a heat wave. Um, and it was myself and Tommy Dreamer. That was the show where the XPW guys showed up. Yeah. And I remember we it was at the Grand Olympic Auditorium where back in the day, Pat Patterson, and Ray Stevens used to sell out that for the territories back in the day. The Grand Olympic was like the, 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 the Madison Square Garden of L.A. Back in those days, it set, it set about 6,000. And I remember Dreamer and I were the main event in a ladder match, Stairway to Hell. We sold out those 6,000 seats. You know, so I can only imagine what a guy like Pillman in the future, you know what I mean? If you, if you could kind of put what wrestling has become and you know what I mean? I, I don't know, man, it just sky's the limit, you know, sky would have been the limit for a lot of them. I mean, you could say that about, you know, RVD Van Dam or uh, Van Dam against, uh, against him as well. You know, uh, a lot of those guys, you could throw Sabu in there against, you know, 
It would have been amazing. I want to I wanna sidebar real quick. You said Ray Stevens. Ray the Crippler Stevens. I was a big fan of him growing up. Now, Rocky, you don't know who this guy was. He mm-hmm. was a greasy-looking little brawler with a one glove on. Mm-hmm. And this guy would beat people merciless in the ring. But he didn't actually hurt them. He just made it look that good. He was the original Crippler before the fallen one, Chris Benoit. And this guy would have great matches. I mean, just great matches. Didn't he tag with Adrian Adonis for a while? He did. Yeah. Well, he's the, he's the reason the Shawn Michaels, what we call the flare and the Shawn Michaels bump, that was the Ray Stevens bump. Ray Stevens came up with the flippy bump on the turnbuckles. The that bump. was him, his original calling card. Oh, yes. So Stevens, of, Stevens yeah. what was he, 5'10", 200 pounds at most? Yeah. Yeah. With a pot belly, but this guy would go into the ring and he would make you believe that he was gonna hurt somebody every son of a gun night that he was in there. He would just do it. And it, it, I loved Ray Stevens. And when I first started watching wrestling in '84, some of the Coliseum stuff had come out, and I would like I, if I begged my dad and I was really good, I I got to you know rent some of that stuff, and I would see Stevens and I would just like. Like this guy is so good. He reminded me a lot of Blackjack Mulligan. Yeah. Similar, but he was just a small, a very small Blackjack Mulligan. Right. But man, his his punishment, the way he would he would choreograph it, Rocky in the ring. Yeah. Like he would he would he would twist your arm, punch you in the armpit, punch you in the teat, punch you in the neck, punch you in the throat. Like he he built a story. For what he was doing. I love Ray Stevens. So I'm sorry I did that. So Rock, what's your next um your 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 next uh forgotten storyline? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stick in ninety seven and it's it's something that we never got an answer to. It's not it's necessarily a, a payoff, but this happened at the ninety nine King of the Ring. The Stone Cold ladder match versus Vince and Shane. Do you remember what happened at the end of the match? I can say I do not. How about you, PJ? So, I do not. It was a ladder match. There was a briefcase in it. Somebody raised the briefcase so Austin couldn't get it, causing him to match. But we oh. were never explained who raised the briefcase. There was no payoff to it. Oh, wow. And then it just, it, like I said, no payoff, nothing. It just kept on going with the story and nothing came of it. So it's not something that people really talk about. I don't think it's that popular, but like a storyline we didn't get because it wasn't actually between two wrestlers that we were expecting to power. It was just something that wasn't explained. So that was something that stuck out to me um, that I found in my research. And then going on, I know, Michael, this one, we both had this one on our list, and that was of the uh, GTV. And on the very first instance that it showed, if you see on the actual – on the um, – the bottom right left corner, it actually said G D T V. Yes. Because, yes. Okay. Oh, so you already knew that. Oh, I was testing you. All right, go ahead and tell us about it. So G D T V was supposed to be Goldust TV, and it was supposed to be like reintroducing him to like. Do you remember? And I hate to say this, and I you know it was a Vince Russo production. I know he's a friend of yours, PJ, but it was G D T V. Val Venus at a urinal next to the big show. Do you guys remember the scene? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where I'm going with this, PJ? No, I don't, but go ahead. So it's it's filmed in black and white, and he's next to the big show, and he looks over as they're urinating, and he says, I thought they called you the big show, and then the big show took his head and slammed it into the wall. Then they had a match that night. Obviously a, a Russo production. Um, but – what it comes down to is that they were they changed it to GTV, and it was supposed to be Vic Grimes. So the original, uh, and of course another Vince Russo, he was going to be key as a kilo of cocaine. Uh, That's dude. what they we all. He was supposed to tag with the Godfather as. I mean, he attacked the Godfather, and it was supposed to be like supply and demand or something like that. It look um. I. I don't write this. I just know it from history. Actually, Supply and Demand was supposed to be the Godfather and Val Venus, and that's how they were going to get together because they were going to go after Key at the same time. Yeah. But at the same point, 
So they did the GDTV, and then it became GTV. And then uh, when Grimes got injured, they said there there was there was no you know point for him to come back because all he could do was take insane bumps, and he wasn't that great in the ring. Now, can you uh, testify to that and tell me how good he was in the ring? Um, I mean, I don't know very much. He was very. Uh... And look, in wrestling, it's it's kind of you know it sucks that it has to be this way, but unfortunately, why not? Maybe not. Unfortunately, there's a reason everything is the way it is. Um, you know, you have to be well liked by people that you know. There were always gatekeepers in wrestling, and I don't believe in gatekeepers in any industry. But in a way, it was there to protect what everybody had built because you know what I mean. In wrestling, you there has to be some kind of loyalty and some weird kind of allegiance alliances and allegiance because you know it's a fake business right it's not real it's not like you could you know in order to hold your position you just got to be really good and not be defeated that doesn't work it's a you know what i mean it's a work it's really much more like a bastardized version of hollywood really we're writing scripts and we're acting it out in a physical manner uh, which i hate to say that about wrestling but it's, it's reality um, so, you know, it, I think that that part always has uh, a part to play. But I think Vic Grimes just never really was a, like, you know, I always made sure that I was friendly with everybody. You had to respect the, the you know, the boys, the, the talent, the promoters, the, the whole industry. You know, you kind of had to pay your dues. And, and I understood that. And everybody liked me. So that's why for me it wasn't hard to get in. But a guy like Vic Grimes, he was just um, quiet. He, he shunned everything in that way, which, I mean, he didn't do anything necessarily wrong that would cause, you know, like, and in reality, like, you know, did he, what did he really do? Nothing. Just quiet. Maybe people took that as being into himself and not wanting to, you know what I mean? It, 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 then jealousy takes over, too. It's like, why is this guy getting, a, you know what I mean, a break? I've been in the business for 20 years. You get that kind of stuff, which is not cool. So, I, I think it's a lot of that, but he really was not well known or even liked in, in the locker room, which I think has a lot to do with the way he was perceived, which is unfair, for, you know, to be quite honest, because he was a pretty good performer in the ring, you know, as far as I could see. Interesting. Well, Interesting. Yeah. Well, I got a little bit more to add before we move on, um, because for me, when this came out in 97, I was I was 10 years old. So this was PG-14 TV. So this was big stuff for me. And I just want to give a little bit more clearly under, clearer understanding about what GTTV is to some of the listeners who maybe weren't even born yet. So it was a storyline device that featured hit, hidden camera footage revealing personal and often controversial moments involving the superstars. Like you mentioned, the one that we saw with Val Venus at Big Show. The two that I remember the most, because one was uh, f- uh, romantic and then the other one was comedy. Comedy one was Al Snow talking to Head backstage, hitting camera in the locker room. He's just having conversations with Head. To me, as a kid, that's funny. And then the one storyline that I actually think got the most progression out of this was the uh, relationship between Stephen McMahon and Tess. You got to see them backstage, you know, kissing and stuff, you know, back in the uh, dock in the docks or wherever. So we got to see that kind of unfold, and that was something that we hadn't seen with some of that backstage stuff. That was that was new to the Attitude Era, so that was very cool for me as a as a young kid. Real quick, as a sidebar, did you ever meet Andrew Martin, PJ? Oh yeah, I worked with him. Unfortunately, Whew. how bad? Stiff as oh boy, was he stiff? Uh, everything hurt. Every just looking at him hurt. Like he's such he's such a nice dude, such a kind soul. Um, I really liked him as a person, but boy. Just everything. It just, if it just everything was pain. Like I don't understand how somebody could be that stiff. That's him, and he wasn't meaning to be stiff. Just didn't have like you know. I could make it look like I knocked your teeth out, and I, you would barely feel my hand. You know, you wouldn't know if you were hit. And where he was the opposite. Like he punched you, and you were like, "What the hell just happened? Like why? Why? Why did it be so hard?" Well, see, no I, I've, I've, I've always tried to figure that one out because, uh, you know, they, they, <laughs> no always said that, the, they, they said that Vince it saw him the next Diesel. They yeah. saw the next Kevin Nash. But he's four inches shorter, has absolutely – and, and I, I'm not speaking ill of the dead. It's just he had no charisma. He had jack point nothing for charisma. 
No, no, he didn't. Unfortunately, you know, he, he didn't. He was kind of, you know, he was a good looking dude, but he was kind of goofy. And it's and it just, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. It just his personality. Like I'm goofy too. Like if I'm Pete, like in the locker room, I'm goofy. You know, I, I portrayed a different character, and then that kind of got over. Um, where I, you know, test it was a little bit harder for him. You know, because he was just, you know. He was, you know, but he was a good dude. You know, I, I feel bad for him, man. He was a lost soul. He dealt with a lot of uh, issues with depression and stuff. And you know, I, you know, you always feel bad for somebody like that. But uh, yeah, he he definitely lacked in the, the that department for sure. Well, you gotta realize that rolls into a lost storyline because he was supposed to be the boyfriend of Stephanie McMahon, but then all of a sudden an affair happens, and she's with Triple H. So what do you guys think would have happened if Triple H never interjected himself or he and China stayed together? I mean, PJ, you'd have more perspective on this than anybody else. Yeah, I see. Uh, um, I I don't know, man. I I I just you know when it comes to when it came down to all of it, I first of all I I saw that I mean the China thing was pretty obvious and out in the open for me you know just again just being around seeing what i saw sharing what we shared um you know i don't know man i i just don't think uh, hunter hunter at that point was just destined to to take the reins it's it was just like for some reason man it was like written in stone i think he just had that hyper focus in some weird way that this is going to be his company. You know, he, 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 I think he felt he was going to be working with Vince for a very long time. And he did. Uh, I just don't think anybody could have foreseen what was going to happen and what happened, you know, and in some ways uh, was best for business as famously, they always say, um, because in reality it was best for business. And I think Hunter's doing actually a great job. Unfortunately, it just took a lot of family mess to to kind of clear all, all that up which is wild if you think about it you know the way it all went down but uh yeah i mean it is what it still is unfo- still unfolding still no, unfold, I mean, and it's gonna unfold still for a long time i, I still don't see vince i still can't see i mean you know, it's all but written but i still can't see vince mcmahon in some way not wanting to or trying to i don't know isn't that weird like you know uh, you know it better than we do bro you know better than we do. It's wild, dude. I mean, Vince, literally, we he, he was, when we used to go backstage for TV tapings, it, it, before it was called Vince's office, in the, like, there was, like, uh, photocopy sheets, like, all over the locker rooms, and uh, Vince's office was called the Emperor's office. So, you, I mean, he was literally the emperor of that ship. Like, that's, he was the man. And now it's like he's, you know what I mean? It's just a couple of years. He's not even in the, you know, I mean, obviously. I mean, man, I, honestly, I don't, I, I don't think his faculties are all there at this point. No, I, so. mean, I don't think they were ever there. I think he lost his mind a long time ago. I mean, I, you know, he's just a wild dude. And I think he lost his stuff a long time ago. But, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it was bound to happen. I just wish it did. I, I kind of wish it didn't happen this way. You know, because I think it, it also does a disservice to his legacy because he did, you know, I, he caused a lot of bad for a lot of people. I know that. But he also he's caused done a lot some of bad good. things, though. We have to be honest with this. He's done some bad things. Oh, he's done some horrible things. He's done some horrible things. But, you know, he also was the, you know, I don't think wrestling would be what it is today if it wasn't for us. So you I always miss have, wrestling. I kind of miss you know? wrestling from 1984, bro. Yeah. I, 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 I miss my territories. I miss, like, you know, Wild Bill Irwin. I I miss Jake the Milkman Milligan. You know, <laughs> I, I miss yeah. these guys. I know, I know. It was, and it was great times. You know, it was a great times. But I mean, would we have WrestleMania be a two night event? You know, in stadiums back to back. You know, selling yeah. one hundred fifty thousand tickets in a weekend. You know, it's it's wild. I mean, you never know, but you know, at I, least look, at least it's in good hands. I mean, uh, at least the WWE now. Well, it's just good hands. You know, it's just weird that it's not in the McMahon's hands. You know, for the first time ever, pro wrestling is out of the hands of, like, the old-timey promoters. It's actually, like, all now in television and, you know, real sports and, like, you know what I mean? It's, like, in yeah. corporate hands. It's just wild. I never would have thought that, you know? So, 
I'm going to throw one out here for you. This was a storyline that died really fast because he jumped ship out of WWF, and that was Ultimate War versus The Undertaker. Oh. Oh, wow. Yes. You don't have to educate me on that one. uh, You know. Undertaker put the Ultimate Warrior in in the casket. He didn't want to put over Mark Calloway, which I don't know why you wouldn't want to put over the best big man ever. I mean, seriously, like it's it's an argument between he and Kane. There's there's no, you know, oh, sure. and yeah, there, there's there's nobody else you could put in that argument. But I, I don't think I don't think then they took him. They they didn't take. I mean. They didn't take him seriously. No, yeah, Undertaker took a lot of years, even after the Attitude Era. It took years and years of that myth of, like, you know, oh, Taker's still here, by the way. You know what I mean? It's like he, like, time kind of was his ally in that way, where he just put in the most time and had the most iconic character, and with that, the myth grew. You know what I mean? And almost like it, 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 it made itself into its own existence, like, you know what I mean? It's like it wasn't even written. Like the streak wasn't written. It just kind of happened. You know what I mean? By accident. Like the, the, kind of the, you know, the building of The Undertaker really happened by accident. He was like, look, he's a top guy. So maybe like he goes into WrestleMania and he just kind of wins every time because he's who's going to beat The Undertaker. But we really don't have anything crazy for The Undertaker as far as plans. So you know what I mean? It just kind of kept silently building, which is great to his benefit. And then all of a sudden you look back and it's like, oh, he's 20 and 0. Really? Okay. You know what I mean? And it just kind of became something that I don't think anybody could have planned, which is great. That's the, that's the, that's the part of wrestling that is magic. Is those like little wrestling things. Magic. That, exactly. You know what I mean? Seriously though. It's like those little things that you, you could find in, in, in some basic storytelling that just happens that you're not really planning for. You know, it's cool stuff. Uh, the, the best match that Undertaker never had, Scott Hall, at WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah. That would that would have been the best match he ever had, and not ever had, but I think they would have put on a clinic. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Scott was man. Scott was see. That's the thing is, Scott was big, but he he always tried to work like he was a smaller guy. You know what I mean? I don't think people give Scott. I mean, Scott was a big dude. You know, he's a very big dude. And Six people seven two seventy. <laughs> that's that's a big guy, right? People don't. You know, you say it, and it's like, yeah, but you know, Taker's bigger or this guy's bigger. It's like, yeah, but dude, guys like Scott Hall, you don't see every day either. You know, you don't go to the Waffle House and see Scott Hall. You know, jacked <laughs> up like you know two seventy to six six seven. You know, you don't but see I, that. I did tell you how I prank called him though. So that was pretty awesome. Him and Sid Vicious, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> stuff. That's hilarious. Oh, dude, I loved that. And, and the way Sid was huffing and puffing, I loved it. Dude. Sorry, Sid Udy, if you're out there listening to my story. Uh, Sid's the best. Yeah. He's Sid, good Sid he's, he's a good guy, but he's... Yeah, he's Sid. But this is one thing I'll give about Sid, is that when I was down in Memphis, living there for a long time, a lot of the people who were like his son's age said that like he was really good about giving back to the community and like, giving back to people. So for you, Sid, good job. Yeah, no, he was. He was always good like that. Sid's a very good guy. That's one thing. As a human being, he was a very nice man and a very kind and giving man. You know, he wasn't a jerk, you know, so a lot of people in his position were. He was not. He was a nice man. We're talking about the same Sid with the hairline temper. Yes, absolutely. Just, all right. He was a good dude. At least the guy I knew was a good dude. He was good to you, but you're also 150 pounds stronger than me. So, you know, I only weigh 145. So. <laughs> Stop it. Now, let's get, into, let's get into some brass tacks and baseball bats. Okay, guys. What are goofy storylines? You saw really disappear because we've been talking about this. Like mm. I talked about, like I talked about mm. Chucky and Rick Steiner. That went nowhere, and that served no absolute purpose whatsoever. And they they did the whole thing to promote the new Child's Play movie. But the fact is, Rick Steiner. Why did you pick Rick Steiner? It made no sense, and it went nowhere. That's kind of goofy. Um, and I, I like 
honestly, what was that 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 goofball's name that um, parodied um, J, J Jim Ross? Oh, Ferrara, Ferrara, Ed Ferrara, Ed Ferrara. Yeah, that guy needs to have his face burned on a grill somewhere for what yeah, he I did. Like, I don't like that dude. You want to say why? I, no, I just I, I never liked that he did that. Yeah, say yeah. why. Clench your palate, PJ. Clench your what palate. What happened? What do you mean? <laughs> Say why you don't like him. Like, <laughs> no, I did. I, did. I, just, I didn't <laughs> like the fact that he just was mean to Jr. Like, I didn't like the fact that he was just, like, attacking Jr. You know, because to me, like, Jr. is, like, all about, you know, he's he's wrestling. You know, if you don't like Jim Ross, it's like you don't like pro wrestling. And uh, it just kind of was, like, I don't know. I mean, it was a WWE ploy. I get it. But uh, I just, you know, don't mess with Jr. Kind of take it personally. I feel yeah. like very 100% agreeance with that. Do you believe that like he points the finger at Russo and Russo points the finger at him? Who do you believe was really behind it? Vince? Uh, I, I don't know. I just think it's, it's one of those things, dude. I honestly believe this. It's just, it, it all got carried out. It was all out of control. Like even all the click stuff, all the stuff that was happening backstage that we all pontificate nowadays and and discuss and all this stuff it, a lot of it was just like just like adults acting like children like just ribs and being dicks to one another excuse my language uh just not being just not being good humans you know a lot of that happened in wrestling and there was no reason for it just guys were jerks you know and it was like that that you know if you were um you were a bully in those days. If you were a big star, you could bully other people. And a lot of bullying happened in, in the business back in the day. And that's really what, what happened, you know, and it's unfortunate. And, uh, you know, a lot of people couldn't even understand it today. It's like, how could that happen? If I told you some of the real stuff that ever happened to me, people would be like, why didn't you just like file a lawsuit with WWE? Why did many people file lawsuits? Like, there was so much cruel stuff going on hazing wise and stuff in the early early in the mid 90s you know it's just you know just something that wouldn't be tolerated today like not even close but back then it was just like the way it was for everybody you know what i mean so it's like you know what do you do what do you say you don't say anything you just kind of go with it right and i think that's a lot of what that is for real you know this like this whole conversation reminds me of an interview I saw with Rob Van Dam when he was talking about CM Punk, and he said like yeah CM Punk is gonna start a you know CM Punk came to him he's like yeah we're gonna do like a, you know locker room meeting and he's like yeah who the hell is CM Punk well who the hell is Rob Van Dam really Rob Van Dam never struck me as anybody besides a person who was given a title because of his skill set which should have been Sabu's title over and over again and he never – he had the charisma of a stoner. Great. You're a stoner. I never saw in Rob Van Dam what everybody else saw. He had a little bit of something. But like when he talks trash about CM Punk, it's like he's had way more longevity not wrestling than you did longevity wrestling. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's definitely a thing. And I could see both. I could see both, uh, both ideals. I could see why Punk would say what he says, and I could see why Rob would say what he says about Punk. Because I, I could, I could see, I could take both, I could take both sides and be, and I can probably convince you I'm right on either one. Because it's like nobody's really wrong. It's just kind of like a preference, you know. Fair and uh, you know, Fair and, and, and I guess, and but no, but I guess guys like Rob, I, I identify with guys like Rob more because we were there for all of it. Like, I just feel like those extra five or six years that you have with a guy like CM Punk, where you literally started ECW and Rob was ECW for a very long time. Um, let's let, I mean, let's, that's the truth. Um, you can't deny that. You can't deny that he was a special generational talent that very few p people will ever attain. You know, and I was I the last man to pin him before he uh, went undefeated. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Who was the last Ooh. man to pin him? I don't know. I have no idea. Chris Jericho. Really? Yeah. Well, keep going. It. No, I, you know, but anyways, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, man. It is what it is. So I think you already mentioned some other 
goofy things. They well, maybe they may fall under goofy, but that was the the birth of the Hannah from May Young, the uh, Katie Vick storyline. You have things that the Vince McMahon Kiss My Ass Club. That one was kind of goofy. Terrible, um, terrible. Yeah, terrible. But one that I when I first saw it, I was like, I don't know how they're gonna pull this off. But due to real life real life events, the storyline was canceled. And that was the one in 2007, the death of Mr. McMahon. So this one was, like I said, this one was canceled because this one ran in June. Mr. McMahon was, appeared to be starting to lose his mind a little bit, lose his marbles. And he was wandering around Raw. And at the end of the show, he steps into a limousine and it explodes. What was it, Brian Kendrick smiled at him and got fired? Well... Well, I guess we'll, we might not ever know that one, but this storyline was actually canceled because of the real life events of the tragedy of the Crispin Wall family. So this one never got to see through. It had there was a lot of media pushback on this one and you know, mixed reactions, and because of what was going on, they just they just had to sweep it under the rug. So, but a death angle on TV for the boss, I don't I don't know how how they would have got around that one. So that one was just. Like I said, that's going to be a lost one on us forever. All right, PJ, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with this one because I'm gonna say that like Vince McMahon believed he could come back and everybody would forget because he could create TV and create reality as far as this wrestling company went. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, it's it's just always been the way for Vince. I think he um, again. I, I I think Vince is a is a strange, weird, one once in a lifetime kind of character in this world, um, and you know, you're not going to have. There's a reason why there's not a lot of Vince McMahon's, you know, because it's just you know he's a wild dude, dude. You know what I mean? He's a wild man. He's a wild person. He's done some crazy things, and a lot of those crazy things worked for him, um, and. You know, as as he got older, uh, things kind of started to come back on him. Like, you know, he he did for a long time have. I mean, the WWE. I mean, when you go into a, a WWE building, I must say, it feels like a fortress when you go in the locker room if you're not if you don't belong there. And you definitely know when you're there that it's Vince McMahon's. Just like again, the way they, you know, they have the signs pointing to the emperor meaning Vince's office, you know, that was, that was what it was. It was. You're in his kingdom. And we all were just like begging or happy to be there in any capacity. It really was like, if you were there, dude, you felt like, cause again, you're making money, you know, everybody's getting hundreds of dollars a day just to work, you know, uh, and do so, sometimes nothing at television, you know, people are, are you know, it was just, you, you'd spend, one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars just on um, extras and food and catering for the boys at TV, and that's a, that's a lot. And that's what, unfortunately, you know, it, it paid for a whole industry underneath itself, you know. And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that as well. But anyways, you know, Vince is just a wild person, and I don't think anybody uh, will ever be like Vince again, for good and for for, for bad and for good. You know, I don't think there'll be another guy like that. That's very interesting information to have. I mean, like, I look at like JCP. I mean, I know you watched a lot of JCP when you're growing up. Rockies before your time, and a lot. I watched a lot of uh, Bill Watts Mid South. To me, that was wrestling. And so when I saw that, like, cartoonish and everything, and the way he took over, I, I, I mean, I was nine, ten years old, but I still like grasped onto what I wanted as wrestling, as opposed to sports entertainment. Right. Yeah. It was a hard time. It was a hard time for you know a nine-year-old wrestling historian. Yeah. Uh-huh. But we're gonna move forward. Okay. So. Hit me. Hit me. All what right, go for it, brother. Go for it. So let's talk about one. I'm going to move uh, into the 2010s here. I'm going to pick one out. This one involves a real life celebrity. This one involves Daniel Bryan. 
This storyline involving Daniel Bryan and Charlie Sheen in WWE took place in 2012 and was part of the build-up to the 1,000th episode of Raw. Charlie Sheen was a social media ambassador. To celebrate the 1,000th episode of Raw, he was brought in as a special social media ambassador, and he was prov- um, he was there on commentary and interacted with fans through social media and during the broadcast. During the broadcast, not the podcast. Uh, at one point, it was teased that these two would face off at SummerSlam 2012. However, the match never materialized. Um, this one kind of fizzled out. I've heard rumors about Charlie's health um, and then about him taking bumps. So this one, it was something, it was just a publicity stunt aimed at leveraging his, you know, his mainstream appeal to draw some attention to WWE programming, which is what they always do with some celebrity. We see it year in and year out. Uh, did any one of you have any feelings or even recall this? It was short lived. Oh, didn't he have the HIV? Wasn't that the uh, beginning of him like uh, finding out he was HIV positive? It might have been. I, I didn't do the that, research that, that, into that, his yeah. actual health problems. I just heard he was having some, so that was part of. Yes, yes, I would say that. I would okay. say that. I bet money on that too. Uh. PJ, I've got one for you. Sure. Jenna Jameson. Yes. <laughs> Don't just say yes like that. What? So she was on a couple of pay-per-views with you, and then she disappeared. Then she was all of a sudden showing up on Raw with Val Venus, which he's no you. But the point is, how was it to work with her, and how was it like so weird that like you – Guys kind of like, I mean, I can get away with this saying, bitch at each other, and then nothing happened. Yeah, it was, it was just, you know, we, it was just a couple of skits. Like, to me, it was never even an afterthought, really. It was just kind of like something we shot, you know, and nothing uh, nothing really came of it, you know. Paulie was always trying to kind of, you know, get as much stuff in the can as far as footage and interview and, and try to just uh, parlay it into anything he could for some publicity. So if you had anybody with some buzz, he would always kind of try to pull that stuff. You know what I mean? But no, nothing was ever, I, there was no real intention of moving forward with her in any way. So that's the drop one, but how, how was she backstage? Was she nice? Oh, she was cool. She was super cool. She was a nice person, you know, kind of quiet, you know, stayed to herself, really didn't bother. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of people, I think, are like more like that. They're just, you know, very laid back and, you know, quiet and unassuming, to be honest. Most of, most of them. All right. So I'm going to drop another one on you guys. Uh, so the first ECW pay-per-view, Big Dick Dudley comes out of nowhere. And Joey Styles yells, it's Big Dick Dudley, and he's out of jail. Now, Big Dick is not with us anymore, and I remember what what um, Stevie Richards said. He's like, I got posters of him all over my room. It's no secret Stevie Richards loves Big Dick. <laughs> he can deliver a promo like no one else, but the point is it, it went nowhere also. And it yeah. was like Big Dick Dudley was the, the enforcer because Brian Lee wasn't there anymore. Now, this is way before your time, but um, can you say anything about like that storyline or anything about like when you came in and, you know, you met the Dudley boys or anything like that? There was really not much to it. Like, I mean, I it was so weird. Big Dick was just kind of like a Jersey guy who was just. Like, he was a big dude, and I think he could get, like, drugs and shit. <laughs> he was, like, the... He had the... Language. Hookup. He was just, like, a connected guy, you know? And he came to the shows, he was a wrestling fan, and they're like, hey, let's bring him in for a spot, you know what I mean? And then more and more, he started to train, and that's kind of how it went. You know, a lot of that happened in ECW, believe it or not. Uh, he had calves the size of trees. Oh, he was a big dude. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought he was a power lifter. I, I thought he and 911 were the same person for a while. They look like the same person. They could be. That's half of Philadelphia, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. All right, so 
to wrap this episode up, let's do some speed questions. Are you ready? No. DJ, that means you. Yeah. All right. All right. Good. We want to do a show with Raven in the future. Are you in? Me? Yeah. I would love to. Okay. Next question. Best choke slam in the business. Oh, that's a good one. Current or all time? All time. Ooh. That'd be all time, yeah. Undertaker. Better than Kane? I was going to say Kane. Yeah, Undertaker, definitely. Okay. Ne- okay. Currently, it would be Damien Priest, but currently, but all time, Kane. Okay. I, I, I'm going Kane. I go Kane. Okay. I got a, I got a, a soft spot in my heart for Kane because he and Undertaker are really, truly the same person. They really are. Um, okay, best power bomb. Ooh. You know what? I like Sid's. Sid, the jackknife, and Batista bomb. Ooh, Dude, I, I took all of those. So yeah. Big Van Batista Vader. bomb was actually very easy to take. Are you serious? Really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love taking it. Dave, Dave loved it because I used to always like I used to sit way up with it, so I'd give Dave like all day to like kind of sit down with it. We, we loved work. I loved working with him. I was like his one of his first matches in WWE. Dave no and I had chemistry, huh? I said no Shizer. You know that's yeah. that's great, man. Yeah, yeah, he was a great dude. I loved working with him. He was actually I could I could see it from there. That he was going to be something. He was like just so charismatic, so good, and, and super cool dude too. So yeah, I always love Dave. So since it's being more adopted nowadays, it seems best yeah. beer, best beer. Yeah, for sure. Spear. Who has the best? Yeah, who has the best beer? Because uh, Bron Breaker. Bron Breaker wears the shirt. It says best beer in the business. So he's putting it out there. But, yeah, but I, I, I even though I don't, I'm not like that familiar with it, just from what I've seen. Obviously, it's the same thing with anything. They're gonna publi- publicize it, and you're gonna have a certain opinion about it if they're pushing it. But uh, if you look at Gold, Goldberg, obviously had a great one. But for for now, I would say Braun Breaker, just because it's hot. All right. Person you never worked with that you wish you would have worked with. Mm. And you can't say Ray the Crippler Stevens. No, I would say uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Great answer. Great answer. I would love to. I would love to do. I would love to play to play Flair in a, in a match with Ricky Steamboat because I could pretty much do that anyways. I mean, but not like that. Do it just so incredible, or do you just PJ Polanco? Huh? Could you do it just incredible, or could you do it as PJ Polanco? It had to be just incredible. Um, PJ Polacco couldn't do anything to Ricky Steamboat. I would be two in my head. I'd have to be just incredible. How do you cane Ricky Steamboat? Easy. Yeah, just you know. We need to have Vic. We need to have Vic Steamboat come out and try to help, and that's who you cane first. Okay. Uh, that was okay. horrible. No, no, it's true. I mean, Vic Steamboat was never Rick Steamboat, but that'd be fun just to see. I mean, even at this age, you could make that work. Probably, yeah. Okay. I got some Worst. honorable mentions. Oh, you still ahead. going? Not, go uh, you no, no, go it? ahead. Go, go, okay. go ahead, bro. Honorable mentions, and you can ask your last questions. Cool? Sure. All right. yeah. Hon- honorable mention storylines for things that were unsolved, uh, just forgotten about no payoff anything and this is like i said there's a laundry list but things i picked out the 2006 kane versus kane angle with the imposter kane being luke gallows no payoff to that one uh you had the nexus bury the undertaker angle with the bear to life match against kane for the world title nexus came out and helped uh kane bury undertaker with no reason rhyme or reason to that no payoff um Dolph vacating the U.S. title, leaves the company, comes back, and... That was dumb pursue, as hell. Doesn't pursue the... Yeah, that was dumb. And then one thing that, due to injury, that didn't play out that I would want your opinion on, and that was something that I would have liked to see play out, and that was the new NWO with Kevin Nash, HBK, and Taker. 
that we saw they were trying to recruit Triple H, but never happened because of the Nash injury. Yeah, um, that would have been great. I mean, you know, any any kind of uh, version with those kinds of names would have been interesting. I'd like to see how that would have played out. Um, you know, it's just it's just a shame how you know, unfortunately, how quickly things were dropped as well. Like, you know, just as much like, uh, as you can get a successful angle or something that pops on television, um, you also, like, can blow something that could equally have been as big, you know, in two seconds. Like, there was just so much, you know what I mean? Like, things just went so fast in those days. Like, if it didn't work in one week, you'd shut it down, which is a shame, you know, because there was a lot of great stuff uh, out there. But, yeah, that would have definitely been one of them for sure. And I, I think one of the more confusing storylines that we had in m- recent memory, and that was during COVID, and that was the Burnt Fiend storyline. I guess everybody was sick and didn't yeah. know what to do, and just that one just was out there, and I don't know how they were ever going to play that one off. But um, anyways, I'm sorry for cutting you off, Gardner. Go ahead and continue your question. No, actually, actually, Justin, I want to ask you something. What was your interaction with Canyon, Chris Canyon? Um... Nothing really, uh, you know, special. Uh, he was a good dude, you know. I, we had mutual friends, um, but I, I never recall really having a much of a, you know, a relationship. You know, just good dude, you know. But I didn't really know him that well. A lot of people believe, well, he believed to, to his death that that he wouldn't get signed or resigned or anything because he was homosexual. Which, I mean, let's be honest. We've all heard the stories like Vince loved true. to watch. Yeah, he, he, I, I listen. I don't. I, I'm not trying to imitate or pretend that I know what he was going through. I do know that um, there, I, there, I, it was probably maybe his perception because there were some bullies in the locker room, you know, and, and people like Bradshaw were definitely amongst those. But it was just, you know, you could say it was just people ribbing. And I think Chris, you know, wasn't really built for that stuff. I think he had had, unfortunately, you know, a very complicated life. And, you know, I was ribbed hard, too. And he was ribbed hard. And it's not for everybody. And a lot of people can take that into a very negative place. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that was the case with Chris. But um, he was, from what I hear, he was a great guy. Um, But I don't think him being gay had anything to do with it. I mean, Pat Patterson was openly gay. And he was... Amongst one of the favorites in the locker room forever. You know what I mean? A lot of no, I, I, I get it. I just, I, I mean? I, it's, it's one of those things that you know that I'm gonna ask. So, and, 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 I, and maybe it's me being naive, right? Maybe it's me being naive. Uh, I don't know. Perhaps, I, like again, I was a, a bit just, you know, uh, removed from that. But I just, you know. But again, I'm not him. I'm not feeling what he, you know what I mean? Only he could feel that, you know, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of times there were there were negativities. Uh, I'm just not sure. I just don't think the WWE locker room was kind of, you know, I don't know. That's open it, it could be, it could be a, it, listen, the WWE locker room could be a rough place if you're George Clooney. It doesn't matter who you are. And what I mean by that is you can be perfect. You can be a, a, a stud. You can be anybody. They're just going to fuck with you no matter what. It's kind of what it is. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the realities that people don't, you know, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people can handle that. At least you're giving us a candid opinion of real life. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's true. I mean, it was a bully mentality there for a long time. You know, and I, I don't think anybody would uh, argue with that. But what are you going to do, right? If you say something, it's on you. You're you're the bad guy for saying for noticing, you know. So if I felt like I was getting abused or shit on, I would just say something, and it'd be like, "It's your fault." What do you? You're the one that's, you know what I mean? So you just learn to shut up, you know. What it was. Mm. I appreciate your honesty. Yep, I always do. All right, fellas. Well, we're closing in. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Tell people where to reach us, and we may have to be pushing another another, another part for this one because, like I said, we really scratched the surface. Um, I I mean, we we really just picked out a few from each decade, and we didn't even really touch. Scratch, yeah, yeah. yeah we, so. But we can definitely go further. 
Um, so yeah, I'm gonna make my notes and and about it. anyways, Rocky T 7 on Twitter. Uh, you know, Gardner, I know we we play phone tag a lot. It's just life is growing and so much more is, is, is on our plates and, and your life is growing and, and your love is growing and, and mine is here with our women. Yeah. And, right. and, but, but it's more with work and, and school. It's just, it's just piling and piling on, but I'm still grateful for the times that we are able to get together. And even if it's last minute stuff, but we do a pretty quick turnaround whenever we, you know, have a topic that we can really sink our teeth into. So, um, you know, if anybody's listening, yeah, something you want to talk about, just reach out and we'll bring it to fruition. I'm out. I'm at, I'm at one four four captain. That is my handle on X, Twitter, whatever the else. And um, you know, PJ, you want to put your stuff out there? Yeah, just uh, just hit me up on uh, X and on Instagram. Both are at PJ Palago, and uh, that's all. Thank you for taking care of stuff. Thank you for taking care of Mav. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Russell Magic brings wrestling magically to you because that's what we do, man. And we want to care. We just want to have fun with wrestling. That's it. All right. Good night, gentlemen. All right, guys. Thank you. It was a pleasure, and I'll see you guys very soon. God bless. All right. Later, fellas. Absolutely. Later, guys. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEPodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to Patreon.com slash WWEPodcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.